So today I'm chatting to, to Casey and um, I'm super excited to talk to you because I think there's a good possibility that you're one of the first CAs that I know that's actually had a book published. Mm. So I, I think this is pretty cool and, and a little unusual. So we're going to chat about that. So, so thanks, thanks very much for taking the time out of your very busy and famous life to, um, <laughs> to chat to us today. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, uh, Yvonne. It's a pleasure. Happy to chat to you, Yvonne, after a while. It <laughs> has yeah, it has been a bit of it has been a bit of a while. I'd love to do this over coffee, you know, in, yeah, in the same room, but, but yeah. it's a little expensive to travel. I don't want to I'm not gonna to chat too much about your 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 background and your qualification journey because we did I did a little interview with you a few years ago. Yes, uh, if you remember. So I'm going to put yeah. a link in so that people can see your journey um, yeah. and your background, which is which I think is important. I think that the only thing that I want to say about that is that your journey was a little messy and not quite ideal. It what you know you weren't like it wasn't the clean leave school go to university get it all nice. Yeah. It was a little messy, um, which I think is important because it was messy. It's now pretty cool, so that's important to know. Still uh, messy. Still messy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, like, what are you actually up to now? Obviously, you know, you've written a book, which we'll get into, but that's not your full-time job. So what yeah. do you spend your time doing? Uh, all right. Um, I, well, I describe myself, you know, I, I'm an accountant, but I feel I'm just, I'm an entrepreneurial accountant. So I just, it's never been my thing to, you know, to have, it, it's, it was never my plan to go to varsity then, qualify as a CA, then get a job and then have that job. And then that, all I do is every morning I wake up and I go to mm. this job and, you know, I, I please my boss and hope for a promotion and get a salary at the end of the month. That, that, that's always been something that I, 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 I thought was boring to me, like when I was in articles and when I was um, an audit manager and an audit mm. partner. I always thought, you know, what more can I do? And I, I was a type, um, I've always been the type of person, if I have finished my work by 5 p.m. and I come home, I'm home by 6, you know, through the traffic, I start wondering, you know, what am I going to do with my evening? And it's not just a thing of, you know, watching DSTV and so on. It's what else can I do? So, um, yeah, so you, from your article, people will know that I, I've been publishing and I've also been organizing events. So that's been mm. something been of interest to me. Mm. Uh, more as, you can call it a hobby, but it's a paying hobby. That's why I call, that's in my view, that's what entrepreneurship should be. You know, do something that is interesting to you, makes a difference, but make something out of it. Because I mean, you know, you need to pay the bills. So I have been um, organizing events. So I came up with this essay, Professional Services Awards, which I, I ran for, you know, five, six odd years. Uh, other than that, I am a CA. I mean, we've worked together building, uh, you know, doing some training work and so on. And I consult with the W Consulting. So uh, of, of the accounting part, what I like is the IFRS part, you know, mm. talks about, you know, whether something should be capitalized or expense, that kind of thing, you know, reading and trying to interpret how things mm. should be light is, is what I like. So, so that is what you could call the, the day job, but, you know, things like writing, publishing, I've always been there. So I've always published a magazine, the African professional right, yeah. into the book uh, because now I was like, you know, let's do something a bit different because, you know, whenever I do something different, I get more excited about it. And that's how uh, I got into the book. And that's basically what I've been doing. And now now that I have a book out, it's a matter of trying to promote the book, trying to think about, you know, what will be the next step, you know, mm. I write another book, will I, what will I do, you know, so yeah. So yeah. who knows what the next thing will be, yeah. So the book itself, um, Masters of Money, I think is such a clever title because, you know, master, yeah. very, very, very trendy word, money, obviously, major trendy yeah. word. Um, and, and, and the cover as well, I mean the cover with the yeah with, the chess pieces with the strategy and yeah. i think they did a good job and and and, and, and I'll, one thing i'll say about that is the benefit of having a publisher is mm. that um, they are in the game right mm. so like masters of money was eventually my title 
but it was after a lot of prompting from mm. them to go back and think about it. So my original title was South Africa's top most financial leaders. That was my title. And they were like, who is going to buy <laughs> and read a book, read the full title when they're like South Africa's, oh man, they yeah, don't I'm have- done. Yeah. It sounds people like a textbook. Only, yeah, yeah, people, yeah. boom, on your face, tell me, what is yeah. this? So what I like, what I like about this um, is, you know, every chapter is a story about a CFO. I'm gonna, I'll put up a list of like the, the people you, you chat, I'll put up like the index page um, yeah. so that people can kind of see who, you know, who and what companies you've, you've spoken to in that. Great. Yeah. Um, one, it's really readable, which obviously is like your intention. You're not, you didn't write this for finance people. You didn't write yeah. this for financial directors. Yeah. So it's very yeah. readable. Um, yeah. It's a nice balance between their corporate careers, a little bit of their, you know, a little bit of their journey um, and their lives, you know, like mm-hmm. the families, stuff that they've struggled with. Da, da, da. So it's it's a little more holistic. Yeah. So I think it's very readable for people who are not necessarily that interested or like, you know, in, yeah. in finance. One, you know, a lot of <clears throat> the people that I work with are students and young professionals who are like, oh, I'm so done with FNAC. You know, I'm so done yeah, with financial yeah. accounting. I don't want to go home yeah. at night and read it. But this is yeah. not that. Like this is positive yeah. and this is like, you know, this is more something you're going to find in a people magazine. <laughs> <laughs> the Thanks. Yeah, that, that, that was the intention you yeah. know so yeah. I, I really really enjoyed that which are your favorite chapters <laughs> yeah that's that's uh, i have the book here so it's open uh, look I, I wouldn't say favorite but there are some people who i think surprised me in a pleasant way so for example glenn fullerton right mm-hmm. uh, you know when i contacted him on linkedin uh, you know, it's just a, a CFO. You look at his his um, profile and you see he went to Jeppe's High School. Then he went to Vitz University. Then he worked for an accounting firm. And then he became a financial. I was like, okay, fine. This guy is going to be another, you know, boring story of, you know, this is how I... Um, climbed the corporate ladder. Yeah, this is how I climbed the corporate ladder mm-hmm in a family of accountants and yes here i am and i'm an accountant right and he he surprised me and i enjoyed his discussion because i mean of the stuff that he went through i mean um yeah. he almost died basically yeah. right he almost died for, for people who ha- obviously haven't read the book he had a yeah. he had quite a hectic cycling accident yeah. and landed up you know doctors told him he was never you know he wasn't going to work again he uh basically should be today paralyzed you yeah. know and so the memory the, thing, I think, was yeah. probably one of the I mean, things lost that his I was memory. So surprised about. Yeah. Don't recognize people. I mean, you tell him my name is Casey. And, you know, a minute later, he asks you, oh, what's your name? It's Casey. And uh, what's your name? It's Casey. Yeah. You know, I was just like, wow. So How do you this, get? Yeah. Because that, that mean, was, um, and obviously yeah. there's the physical stuff, which was quite hectic. But I think yeah. what struck me for someone working at that level in the finance world, the idea idea that your memory you know your Mm. like memory was for me that that struck me as like that that almost was scarier than the physical stuff yeah because i mean if you think like maybe if you lose your legs then you can still sit behind a computer and still whatever uh but i mean this was also you lose your mind as well and people telling you that you won't be able to make it and he's like you know stuff you i'm gonna make it no yeah uh so him i mean so anyone who told me personal stories, because I th- everyone has a personal tragedy, even if it's, you know, losing someone close to you and so on. Mm. So CFOs who actually opened up. I mean, there's the other CFO. He basically was in a, in a typhoon, right? With a pregnant wife and they yeah, got- Yeah, the tsunami. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, in a tsunami. And uh, they split up and he had no idea for like half an hour where the hell she was. There was water. There were dead bodies on the street. I mean- that to me, that's why you say it makes it readable because mm. I'm to tell you, okay, fine, boom. Here's a guy called Sean. He's a CFO of Aspen and this is how much they are selling. I mean, all that is important because they need to say how they contribute to the success of their company. But what's the backstory? At the end of it, just the same way you've asked me today, 
what's the backstory yeah, yeah, yeah. so how how what, what is tell me what makes you who you are mm, you know? mm, mm. and so those are the people that i enjoyed speaking to um i mean there are other people i mean there are people who uh grew up in in homes where there was no food at night mm. uh, and you know today they are you know there's the one lady she became the youngest ever uh cfo of a listed company and she grew up in a home where there was no food like they they used to go to bed hungry and she didn't have any money and so on and she was like you know what i am going to lift us out of poverty and so on and, and where she is today and and the kind of knowledge she uses despite being so young is, is quite brilliant yeah yeah so those kind of stories that that i enjoyed i love the one um abigail she she went to university and the reason she chose accounting was because it's a shorter queue (laughs) i think that's i think that was the that was the um the title that i gave the yeah you did story the girl who who chose the shortest queue because she was going there to study arts and the arts queue had uh, a thousand people (laughs) queuing up and then looks at Unisa and looks and sees, oh, okay, there's only 30 people on that queue. I don't know what's going on there, but I'm going there because we're not going to stand in the sun for two hours. Let's go stand for 15 minutes. And she gets to the desk and she's told, okay, this is for accounting. Cool. Oh, Sign up. And I was like, wow, that, that's just funny. I mean, and today she's CFO of Sunlam, which is the biggest insurer on the African continent. Yeah. You know? so, yeah. Yeah, who knows if she took the longer queue where she would be. So it's one of those things. I don't know if it's serendipity or if it's, you know, just like go with the flow and make the best out of it. There is some lesson out of that. Yeah. You kind of think if, if you know, at that level, you're very, you know, you're very serious yeah. player in the finance world. You kind yeah. of think, well, you must have wanted to do this from the age of 12. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. so I mean, like yeah. You're just waiting for her to say, you know, I've always loved numbers. Yeah. <laughs> knew it from the second year that I was going to become an accountant that's what you were that, and then yeah. she said, well let me just be honest it was just the cue it was her it was also Abigail I think she said that um she changed like careers mid you know she changed industries like yeah. later on you know yeah because obviously because she's working with Sunlum and actuaries and stuff there's a lot to do about like you know people's lifespans and you know all, all that so she kind of thought about the fact that since we believe that the first person who's going to live to a, to 200 is yeah. now alive. Yeah, yeah. Changing your career path in your like 30s mm. or even 40s yeah. isn't such a big deal. It's not. Yeah. You know? And I think I love yeah. that because I have I have people who email me all the time going like I'm 26 and now I want to start becoming a CA is it too late for me and I'm like Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I mean on. you should tell them to read about Abigail and what I know. that. I mean people are are living past 100 and yeah. uh, I, mean, there's, I mean there's many countless examples and the people who also mentioned because i asked them you know what book do you like um you know what uh, you know who inspires you mm. the people tell you things like that you know i'm inspired by this person who started this business when they were 60 or they started that or the whatever and they all have that uh thing because i asked you know one question that i asked is you know what would you tell your 25 year old self and a number of people said that, you know, to say um, I, I need to go back to 25 and wish I would have done things differently is not so important because I'm in my mid 40s or early 50s and I can still make the changes that I want to make. It's not it's too not late. over. Yeah, uh, I, I, love, I love that. I think um, and especially because I do, I get such panicked, you know, I get such panicked messages from students like, is it too late for me? And um, I'm also like, actually, it may be better because, well, not better, but like, it's actually really valuable because whatever experience you've had up to now, you can still leverage off of. It's not as though yeah. you're throwing it in the dustbin and yeah. then, you know, going in this completely different direction and that's all worthless. Um, yeah. You know, there's, use that leverage on it and now add, you know, add something different. And it's even more important now because the world is changing so fast. Yeah. You, know, you can't just have blinkers on and go, I'm going to do this, you know, yeah. for, for the rest of, you know, for the rest of my life. The world is so different. So if you're living to 200 and you obviously, you know, with that, you, you need to look after your health and all of that stuff. But like, yeah. if you're living to 200, changing careers in your forties is like, come on. One of the things that I wanted to, to highlight about her, her story was some of the challenges that she had 
Yeah. Is this, is this the, the, like, for example, the, the challenge she had with her boss? I, I don't yes. Know. Yes, but, yes, yeah. yes. So she and, was... And that's why I liked CFOs like those who opened up and told... Because one question I asked is, you know, what, what's the worst day that you have? And she ah. says, she talks about... Um, and, and this is good for your students because they need to know how hectic it can be when you become an accountant. Mm. How your IQ is important because that's the one thing that we keep thinking about when you're students. You keep thinking, is my IQ sufficient to qualify? Is my IQ sufficient yes. to become <laughs> successful and so on? Then you realize IQ is part of it, but EQ, emotional uh, quotient is is sometimes even more important, you know, how you handle people and how you handle situations is what's going to take you to the next level. So she about this boss who they had worked the whole night and he was at home, right? And they call him in the morning and say, this thing is not balancing, you know, it's not balancing. And they, she's hoping for him to tell her, you know, oh no, it's fine. I'm going to come in and help you or, oh no, we'll just send the report and, We'll tell them that we are still working on it. And the guy was just brutal. And he was just like... It was the comment, the, he was like, he laughed at her. He what, laughed at her. So funny. Exactly. He's like, do you not understand just, what I'm saying? He just laughed. Like, okay, so wait, what are, you, what are you hoping? Do you think I'm going to tell investors that we have a balance sheet that doesn't balance? Make sure. Go back, get it done. Got it, yeah. Up. You know, yes. and she sat in the car and cried because she. I love, I love that as well. And there's, there's a few of those that I, that I picked up. And again, I wanted to kind of highlight that is that when you're on the outside and you're looking at people in, you know, these kind of roles, in a way, because they kind of have to, they kind of look like they got everything together and they're in control. Yeah. But yeah. this, again, the behind the scenes is like, I love the fact that she said, I went and sat in my car and cried because and cried. I had no idea what to do. Exactly. You know? And she's like, I didn't want to cry in front of the team because I didn't want the team to know that, yo, we are in, we're in okay. trouble to keep yeah. this face. Like, guys, we are going to do this. It's going to work. Don't worry. So if you need a moment, take some time out. Yeah. Go to the car, cry it out, you know, and then... All right, I'm good. Let me gather myself and then go back. Yeah. And then yeah. let's. And then, I mean, that worked. You know, take some time out. She went back in. They, you know, had some, re looked at it from a fresh point of view and got the got yeah. the job done. I enjoyed the honesty, and I think um, no matter what level you are, where you are, how qualified you are, there will be challenges that you're not prepared for. You know, again, for example, and obviously a couple of, because of the timing that you wrote this, quite a few of the challenges are COVID related. There's no textbook yeah. you know, that told us how to deal, told any yeah. CFO how to deal with a global pandemic. Like this was not yeah. in a textbook. This was not in my question. Correct. Yet, they're responsible and have to come up with that. And it's something that I tell my students is like, you think that once your exams are over and you're qualified, you're going to have the answers to everything and everything is going to be calm and easy. And you're going to be like, sweet, I'm the guy, you know, I'm the girl who knows what's going on. Like, let me tell you, as you progress, yeah. the challenges get worse. And then you're, and that was also something that she mentioned that I loved is like, when you're the director, when you're the dude, or the girl at the top, yeah, everyone expects you to have the answer. And it's lonely, yeah. you yeah. know, because there is no textbook. Yeah. And it's it's as bad. In fact, it's worse than writing exams. It is worse. It because is because there's no suggested solution. Nobody's yeah. marking you, and you don't get yeah. to come back and try again next year. <laughs> yeah, and you know, you know, like for her, I think when when she what I gather from that discussion is like she was like this dude. We've been working all night. He's been at home. He had a nice night's rest, and uh, you know his life is cool. And we must balance it for him and so on. Yeah. But the the kind of pressures that she now experiences as a CFO, she's like, wow, that was even much better because we were working as a team. Mm -hmm. If you work out, it's for someone else to go and as a CFO, you need to go and present mm -hmm. investors. You need to present to the press. You mm -hmm. need to tell them, this is why things did not work out. There are people just speculating and saying, you know, are you the right person for the job and so on, you know? So the pressures is, even 10 times more, you realize it when you're there. And they even talk about that loneliness. You know, once yep. you become, it's very lonely at the top. 
You know, once you come and you walk in and everyone just treats you as the boss and you have to go into the room and everyone just comes to you for answers because you must have answers. So not answers only for people who are below you, but people who are beside you so or above you, like the yeah. CEO and so on. They're like, you're the numbers guy. This is the plan that we want to yeah. make. You yeah. must find the funding. You must find the money. You must make it happen. Yeah. You know, you must find the answers. I really enjoyed the, the women's stories that we had. Um, I mean, there's like Merunisha, for example, yes, yes. talks about how uh, she's being judged at the audit firm because she, they say she's not social enough. She doesn't yes. come on Fridays uh, to the bar and hang out with uh, the other members of staff. You but know, she's Muslim and she doesn't drink. She, she doesn't drink. She's Muslim, yes. she's female. In, in, in Muslim culture, women don't interact That's, with men at that level and so on. Yeah. But you know, these are the things that people will re- experience in their articles, that people culturally may not really understand your, your cultural uh, positioning and may not apply their minds to yeah. how you are. Uh, there's another, uh, another uh, lady as well who talks about how, you know, in, in boardrooms as a woman, then you're the CFO there, but you know, people will be like, uh, okay, we need someone to take the minutes. And then yeah. <laughs> it's exactly then, what I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We need someone to take the minutes. Oh, uh, why, why don't you uh, quickly uh, make notes? I'm sure you have a nice handwriting, you know, or whatever, or they plan things and they say, okay, fine. What are we going to do for marketing? Let's do a golf day. Let's get a box in a stadium and so on which are not activities that are of interest uh, to ladies anymore. So it's, again, talking about how you need to make other people realize how they are off or people swearing yeah. in boardroom mm-hmm. uh, and you're sitting there mm-hmm. as a lady. And um, I think Abigail, for example, talks yes, about Yes, she mentioned that. Yeah, she, she said, said she started kind of swearing. Guys. She started yeah. like swearing quite a bit because that was the culture. And it was like, yeah. and, then and then you're trying to fit in. You're trying to yeah. be one of the guys and you're not one of the guys. Yeah, you know? yeah. So I found those 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 uh, experiences that people talked about to be quite interesting. And that was the point. I didn't want, I mean, it was very easy for us to just go and pull out um, the annual financial statements of each CFO for 10 years and to do a study of how well they performed. But mm-hmm. that's important and you can read for that yourself. So this was mm-hmm. to end the scenes to ask, okay, fine, tell me how. I know what the numbers are and I can read what you've written in the annual report. But just tell me the hows and whys and what, if things, and, and it's not all rosy. There are people where things have not worked. Tell me yeah. why yeah. are they not working? What could you have done differently? What mistakes are there? What are the strategies actually that someone can be successful, not only as an individual, but when they assume a role in the financial space? Yeah. Yeah. 